The thinking about children who are missing detail. Um, in the groups I run, children have to know that there are anonymous, identifiable and known donors. Because being in the group is not the place where they have to find that out for the first time. And it's quite common for parents only to talk about the kind of donors that their child has. So before a child comes to the group, they have to be aware, a child with an ano a completely anonymous donor, that there are going to be children who know far more than they do. But in the group, when they hear all the things about that other people know, I have looked at the faces of children. When a child says, and what do you know? And they're saying, he had brown eyes, she had dark hair, she's five foot two. And the other children say, is that all you know? And say, yeah. And I certainly know of some young people who've really struggled with that, um, who have particularly, I think, when it's double donation, it's like, well, who am I? And how am I ever going to know? And I think that's a very, very tricky position for a child to negotiate as they go into adolescence. It doesn't mean very much when they're little. When they're going into adolescence, well, what are they drawing on? And I think that's very hard. How do I work with children where the lack of detail is an issue? It often doesn't present itself as the first thing, but it's around. So, for example, a child who is at school and in a class, they're asked, we're doing science, make a list of the ways in which you're like your mum and your dad. A thoughtless, insensitive teacher's question puts them in a difficult position. I have known children become school phobic because they don't want to find themselves in that situation. So, one of the things that helps it's not a long-term strategy, but one of the things that helps is other children realising that other children have donors, they don't know anything about them, or very little. Um, I think the knowledge, albeit very sketchy, at that kind of age, 9, 10, 11, 12, that there is something, there's a test that might give them more information. Uh, we make sure all children know that in the UK the law changed. So you then have an interesting dynamic about the children who were conceived in another country who say, well, why did my parents make that choice? Interesting one to think about. Um, but I think children now have an idea that things can change <clears throat> and they might be able to find out more than anybody th thinks they can. But being this links back to what I said about identity being sort of socially constructed and constructed in a community, is that when children are part of the donor conception community, where that is something that they realise they're not the only one, then there are other children, other families who are like them. It can be less of an issue to deal with on a daily basis. I'm not saying that it doesn't become a much bigger issue when they're 16, 17, 18 and into adulthood and when they become parents, but it's managing it as a child when you've got a limited language to talk about it. People don't often give you the space to find more creative ways to express it. Um, and I think it's really important that children have the opportunity to talk about all the aspects. Of course, they're very pleased to be in existence but they can also find it being a burden. They can feel angry, they can feel sad that they don't have the biological connection with one or both parents. Um, and, you know, we often have very interesting conversations about real, you know, because children don't use the parlance of genetic parent and biological parent and gestational parent. They think of the people who look after them and the other people, and they know that's a sort of parent. So it's very much also about using children's language, which makes a difference.